Hey, welcome to SI Now. It is Thursday, January 5th, and I'm Maggie Gray. So happy to have you with us. Coming up, one former Detroit Lion will explain how the team can pull an upset in Seattle, and Grant Wall will bring us up to speed on everything happening in the world of soccer. But we begin with a legendary coach. Bobby Bowden is the subject of a new film called The Bowden Dynasty, a story of faith, family, and football. The film debuts this weekend in advance of Monday's national title game. Yesterday, we showed you part one of my interview with Bowden, where we discussed Nick Saban, Lane Kiffin, and more. Today, we bring you part two. The Hall of Fame coach relives his successes at Florida State, and he tells us what kept him in Tallahassee, even when his dream job looked to be a reality. Every program from high school to the pros says it's all about family. You preached it as well, but what made your message unique? A lot of times I would get phone calls from mothers, maybe they didn't have a husband, trying to raise a 14 or 15 year old son. And they would ask me, coach, what must I tell my son for him to be successful? And I would tell them the same thing every time. I say, tell him to get his priorities in order. Don't go through life just wandering around. You know, number one, God. God's your number one priority. Tell him number two is his family. Number three, education. Football don't come in there yet. You know, don't make football your God. You get yourself in trouble. You know, because you ain't going to win all your ball games. And so I, that, I, feel, I feel like it's the first thing anyone has to do to be successful, get the priorities in order, you know. And how did you do that while also recruiting teenagers? Well, well I, you know, of course, raising children, I, I'd been, th been through it with my own family. We had two girls and four boys, and that's the way I was raised. My mother and dad raised me that way, you know, so it's all I ever knew. So it's easy for me to teach it, you know. We see that you overcame rheumatic fever as a child. Yep. You had the two wide right kicks that kept you from a national championship. Those were obstacles. Yeah. Aside from that, it seemed like it was pretty great to be Bobby Bowden throughout your life. Well, I, I coached 57 years. You know, I had uh, six different jobs in 57 years. I didn't apply for one of them. Now, can you imagine that? No. I never applied for one of these jobs. They call me. We want you. So I, I feel like I really lived a charm life. So life is, life is, I've been very fortunate. Now, last two, two weeks ago, I've been, I was in the hospital for six days. I've never been in a hospital in my life. I couldn't believe it. You know? How but difficult it, was that? Anyway, I'm feeling pretty good now. If you were starting now, when you think back on 57 years of coaching, do you think you'd have the same success that you had previously? Uh, how do you know? I don't, you know, I, I don't know it. It's a good question because you, there gets more and more good coaches. Everybody's getting good players. Everybody's got good players. You know what? You watch a team play, and you see a great tailback. Now, Alabama, Florida State's got a great tailback. Alabama's got a great tailback. You look around the country, there are hundreds of them. Everybody's got a great tailback. You know what? So that makes it, makes it hard to just win all the time. But what were those recruiting wars like when it was Florida State and Miami and Florida and all the programs were at the top of exactly. your Exactly. There was one year where we were one, two, three. Can you imagine that? Three schools at one state being in the top three in the dead gum nation. You know what? And it's terribly competitive. And it, you know what used to make me mad? I had to play both of them. <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't play each other. You know, Florida, Florida quit playing Miami and, and uh, Notre Dame quit playing Miami and Penn State quit playing. I had to play them every now and then. And I took, had, I took half my losses. I spoke with your son recently. He told me a funny story. Who is he this? Said, your son, Tommy. Oh, Tommy? Told me a funny story. What in the world? He said that there were times when, he, when you and the program wanted to show the players at Florida State that there were people out there who were doubting them. Yeah. But you couldn't find anybody who was actually saying that. So he used to go down to the newspaper, and they used to find old clips of news stories doubting Florida State that had nothing to do with your team, print them up, and leave them on the seat of every player, either in the meeting room or on the bus on the way to the game. Yeah. Did you need that to keep them motivated? Probably. <laughs> Coaches are always looking for some way to keep them motivated, some way to get them motivated. Dying to find an article that says you're no good. Who's there? Would I, 
So, so I can show my boys, you know, doing things like that, you know, so I don't doubt it. And at one point, your dream job of Alabama oh, yeah. came calling. Well, I was raised in Alabama. Uh, my dad used to take me down to Alabama games. The best thing I ever did is not take it. Why? Because I, I did want it. I, was, I'm doing, that's, I thought that was my home. I thought that was meant to be, you know. <clears throat> but I'd been following a great football coach. I, I, I wouldn't want to follow Bear Bryant. <laughs> Just like I, I'd hate to follow Nick Saban right now, you know, because they'd expect you to do as good and be, be mighty hard to copy. What do you want people to know after watching this movie? What do we not know about Bobby Bowden? I would like for other coaches to see that you can win doing it right. Now, if, I, if, I, all, if we won all those games and I cheated, uh, we wouldn't make this movie. I wouldn't let them, you know. If we played all these games and we didn't win, we were honest and did it right, but we didn't win. I, I didn't, who's going to buy that? You didn't win, you know. What? But we, we tried to do it right, and we won at the same time. I want other coaches to see that and, and, and go ahead and stay on the right track. Don't try to take shortcuts, you know. And I want players to see that all they can do, all they can do is their best. That's all you can do, son. Just play the best you can play, you know, and then let the chips fall where they may. Coach Bowden, it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. I should mention the movie, The Bowden Dynasty, debuts live in theaters nationwide from the NCAA Football National Championship in Tampa. The movie debuts January 8th. You can catch the game, of course, on January 9th. Bobby Bowden, what a life, what a character. As we turn to senior soccer writer Grant Wall. Grant, before you covered soccer, you covered a little bit of everything in Sports Illustrated. You ever come across Bobby Bowden? I did come across Bobby Bowden in sort of a tangential way. Uh, my first year at Sports Illustrated, I was a fact checker. I was not a writer at that point, and I shared the office with a fact checker who didn't know college football all that well and had to cover or fact check a Florida State story. And she pronounced his last name Bowden all the time on the phone one day with all the, F the Florida State people. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> as much of a legend as Bobby Bowden is all across the country, that's a humbling story. I've got a million fact checker stories I can tell you from over the years. That's one of them. We'll have to do a whole SI Now episode with all of those. But we should get to the soccer. And let's give an update, really, on what's happening with the U.S women's national team. We thought that 2017, or we believe, it will be a big year for them. They've been very public about their fight for equal pay. And now that the calendar has flipped to January, what's happening? What's the latest? Well, everyone knew that their collective bargaining agreement ran out on December 31st. So you may be asking yourself, why is there no work stoppage? Why did U.S. Soccer announce on Wednesday that there would be a camp in California with basically all the top players who are going to go? Well, what happened is, is that according to the contract, one of the sides had to give a 60-day notice of a work stoppage before a work stoppage could take place. Mm. Neither side did. And so right now, they are still operating under the old CBA, and they're going to go forward here. Uh, I don't expect a work stoppage at this point, because the big news was on December 28th, the Players Union announced they had fired Rich Nichols, their very hard line, very aggressive leader who had been rattling sabers with U.S. soccer for, you know, well more than a year at that point. So uh, clearly now the, the stance that the U.S. women's players are taking is a softer one, not as hard line, though they're still going to try and negotiate and get the best deal possible. Was the them not filing that 60 day, you know, the, the 60 days before the work stoppage, was that an oversight by their lawyer? Is that why they moved on from him? I don't think so, because a year ago, he actually had filed the 60-day notice when he was claiming that the CBA ran out earlier. It was later determined by a court that it didn't get very complex. Right, that led to a lot of will they strike, will they not strike before right. the Olympics talk, sure. But he had filed the 60-day notice in the past, so clearly he was aware of it. But uh, I know there was dissatisfaction among the U.S. players with how hard a line that Nichols was taking with U.S. soccer. He had basically been installed by Hope Solo, and she had won over enough players to vote him in as the new executive director of the union a year ago. Hope Solo has less influence now. She's not even 
uh, you know, she's suspended for a couple more months from U.S. soccer. Her contract was terminated, and there's a question of whether she'll ever return to the U.S. national team. Very interesting. So you're not expecting any kind of work stoppage, but what can we expect with regards to their fight for equal pay? Will they get it this year? Well, there's two things going on here right now. There's the CBA negotiations, and on the other side, there's the EEOC filing that the U.S. women's players made with the U.S. government about wage discrimination compared to the U.S. men's team. So we're waiting for a ruling on on that. Now, a CBA, I think it's going to be very hard to negotiate totally equal terms on everything with the U.S. men. Now, what some of the areas where they could negotiate equal terms are on things like per diem, business class travel, things like that that I think they'll get from U.S. soccer. Very interesting. We'll keep our eyes peeled for that. Turning to the med side, former U.S. men's national team men's coach, of course, that would be Bob Bradley. Well, he did make history in 2016. <laughs> A little short-lived. He became the first American to coach a Premier League, manage a Premier League team. It lasted 85 days and 11 games. Well, it was fun while it lasted. What's next for him? Well, I had a really interesting, honest conversation for my podcast this past week with Bob Bradley after he'd been fired. I don't know how many coaches in his situation would have spent 40 minutes on a podcast with someone like me, but he was brutally honest about what happened in his opinion at Swansea, what he would have done differently perhaps, maybe not be as open and honest with people behind closed doors who he hadn't built a relationship with yet. Uh, he thinks that may have hurt him in the end, but also what may come next. And the good news for Bob Bradley is he is still in demand. This was such a short-term situation that I don't think he's lost uh, his respect internationally. Now, he already met yesterday with uh, the folks at the Norwegian Soccer Association about the, the open Norwegian national team job. Uh, he has a good reputation in Norway after having coached there at club level. I also think LAFC will rekindle their interest in Bob Bradley. They had approached him before he took the Swansea but City But does he job. get another Premier League job? Not right now. Not right now. You know, this is a situation where I know Bob Bradley has done so much in his journey to try and put himself in position to get that Premier League job, uh, working in sort of remote outposts in Europe, in Norway, in France, uh, in Egypt as well over the years. So I guess the question for me now is, does Bob Bradley want to stay in Europe? Because if he does come back to a, a lucrative job at LAFC for 2018, then that sort of shuts off, I think, coaching in Europe down the line. If he thinks he has another crack at the Premier League someday or he wants that, he'll probably stay in Europe. Very interesting. Uh, let's go to Europe. Reigning European champions, that'd be Real Madrid. They've really shocked us all with just how dominant they have been, not only going back to last season, but now this season. Can you tell us why? Well, a lot of people thought when Zinedine Zidane was hired as their manager that this was a big risk. Here's a guy who had not managed, uh, you know, been a head coach before. Such a great reputation as a player, but that's never a guarantee. And he's been amazing. You look at the, the numbers now, 38 games unbeaten for Real Madrid, competitive games. That's fantastic. And this weekend against Granado, when the Spanish League starts up again, they have a chance to tie the all-time record for an unbeaten streak in Spain, which is just incredible, uh, the success that Zidane has had in his first year on the job. Very interesting. Of course, love Zinedine Zidane, the style inspiration perhaps for Grant Wall. <laughs> just a little bit. You guys get mistaken for each other all the time, I'm sure. Grant, appreciate it. Thank My you. Pleasure. Wild Card Weekend is nearly here, and Saturday night, the Detroit Lions will look to win their first playoff game since 1991. Lomas Brown was a member of that Lions team, and he's now the author of a new book called If These Walls Could Talk, Stories from the Detroit Sideline, Locker Room, and Press Box. Lomas, Seattle, it's one of the hardest places to play. How can the Lions pull off the upset on Saturday? Yes, it is a very, very difficult place to play. I think the best thing for the Lions is going to be to shorten the game. They're going to have to control the ball, and they're going to have to try to control it with the run or short passes. You're going to have to keep Seattle's offense on that sideline and try to just control the ball and see if we can shorten the game, maybe a special team turnover or something on special teams that can get us some great field position or maybe even score. But it's going to be important that we don't keep our defense on the field a lot and our offense controls the ball. You mentioned shortening the game, yet you have Earl Thomas, who's injured for Seattle. So maybe the thought process would be to try to take him deep 
yet you have Matthew Stafford who has an injured finger and he's wearing a glove. Clearly his accuracy has dipped. So how do you write those two things? Can Stafford even try to take advantage of the secondary missing such a big piece in Earl Thomas? Well, the, the most important thing is to stay balanced. And, you know, we've been having problems doing that, the Detroit Lions not being able to run the ball as effective as we could. So we kind of been a one-dimensional team all this season. But once you get into the playoffs, you have to have balance. You have to be able to balance it up. So, yeah, we're going to have to take our shots when we can downfield against the Seattle secondary. But you're going to have to be able to establish the run where you can keep Seattle's defense alive and also Matthew because you get in a situation like that where these guys, Michael Bennett, Cliff Avery, if they could just pin their ears back, they're going to make it a long day on Matthew. So you're going to have to stay balanced and you're going to have to take shots when shots present themselves. Yeah, I would ask you for a prediction in this game, but I'm not going to waste your time. I'm assuming you're picking the Lions for an upset. So I want to move on because I'm assuming you must be absolutely thrilled by how much attention and praise the Cowboys offensive line is getting this year. Lomas, are they better than Dallas's O-line during their run in the 1990s? Wow, that's a great, great question. And I, I, right now I have to say no. I have to say that the Dallas Cowboys line that Emmett Smith ran behind was probably one of the best lines that I've seen, you know, besides seeing the Hogs and some of those lines. Uh, you got a Hall of Fame man, Larry Allen, off that offensive line. Uh, you got Nate Newton, who's been nominated. Uh, Mark Tuane was on there. Eric Williams. You know, they had pro bowlers all along that line. I think this, their, this version, the the present-day version is comparable, but I wouldn't say they're better than the uh, offensive line that Emmett ran behind. But they're a very, very, very good unit. And that's why Dallas has had the success they've had, regardless of what the rookies have done. It's been because of that offensive line. Oh, no doubt about it. And, you know, people are clamoring for the O-line to just be given the MVP award this season. Now, we know that's <laughs> not going to happen, but – Lomas, if it was up to you, how would you honor this great season that the Cowboys O-line has had? Well, to me, uh, again, you know, you get MVPs, and they do give MB MVPs out for outstanding offensive linemen. I don't see how you could just give it to one person. You have to give it to that group if you're looking at the offensive line, our offensive lineman MVP. It's hard to say that as far as the MVP race, and it's hard to just stick – one guy out on the line because, you know, as an offensive line, you play as a unit. Like we always say, you have to operate like a hand in the glove. If one guy isn't doing his job on the offensive line, that play isn't going to be successful. So you have to work together up front. So if you gave one award out, it would have to be for that total unit. Yeah, we saw Ezekiel Elliott brought his offensive line some cheer. He brought them all these – John Deere ATVs. We know that <laughs> this is always a fun thing where a quarterback or running back will buy gifts for their offensive line. The holidays sure. just passed. So, Lomas, what was the best gift you ever received? Well, you know, the little fella, Barry Sanders, he took care of us. So, you know, I, one year he gave us first-class tickets anywhere in the world. Uh, we got the uh, we got the presidential Rolexes his first year. He gave us the presidential Rolexes. Uh, big screen TVs, you name it. The little fella, he took care of the big fellas. That's why we tried to take care of him. Um, but I, I, I would probably say the Rolex meant the, the most um, because he inscribed on that thanks for a great 89 season, Barry Sanders. So I think that would probably be the one that means the most. Wow, that's really special. That's really fun to hear. Um, it seems like everyone loves Ezekiel Elliott, obviously, including the offensive line. You mentioned Barry Sanders. You blocked for him for years in Detroit. Any similarities between those two backs at all? Or are they very different? Yeah, they're different. I, I would say Ezekiel's uh, more co comparable to Emmett than Barry. I, to put it this way, Barry's son plays for uh, plays college football and he doesn't even run like his dad, and he has the DNA, and he doesn't run like his dad. So I would say they have totally different runners. Barry has so much more shake and would try so many more different things 
uh, he was more daring than I think Ezekiel is because naturally Ezekiel has the hole sitting right there in front of him. So it's just easier to hit the hole right there. But they're very, very different runners. Yeah, very interesting to get your thoughts on that. And yeah, maybe Emmett Smith is the better comparison there. Um, of course, Lomas, you're a Super Bowl champion. You won a ring with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. John Gruden yeah. was your coach. And this time of year when there are multiple coaching vacancies, his name comes up. Yeah. He was offered that L.A. Rams job. Do you think that would be too good for him to pass up? I, I, I would have to think so. And, you know, knowing Coach, uh, here's a man that still gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning preparing uh, for Monday night football. You know, he, he prepares just like he's still – in the office with the coaches, with the players. And, you know, if that's in your blood and you're still preparing like that and you're not involved in the game from the coaching standpoint, then, yes, I have to think that he has this itch and that if that came along, the right situation, I think, and if he got the right controls that he would want and everything, I, I would have to think, you know, that would be too good to pass up. I really would. I know Coach – you know, the challenge. I just think the challenge, he loves the challenge. And he's conquered this Monday night football challenge. He's very good at that. So I would have to think another challenge. I could see him doing that. Listen, if the Rams keep adding zeros to the end of that paycheck, it might not be all about the challenge. It might be a little about the do-re-mi. Uh, Lomas, thank you so much. Again, the book, it's called If These Walls Could Talk, stories from the Detroit sideline, locker room, and press box. Always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maggie. Take care. Take care. That's going to do it for this Thursday episode of SI Now. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern when I'll be joined by Heisman winning running back Eddie George and Super Bowl winning defensive tackle Malik Jackson. Until then, stick with SI.com for all the latest news. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow.